Good afternoon. My name is Tom Simchak. I'm ESA's Research and Programs Director. Thank you for attending today's webinar titled Energy Storage 101, Project Economics. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on www.energystorage.org. Uh, questions can be submitted at any time throughout the webinar via the chat box in your browser. Following the webinar, uh, you'll receive a brief survey regarding today's topic and topics for future webinars. Uh, your feedback will ensure that ESA provides uh, the highest value information to you and your organization. Uh, we really do value that feedback, so please do uh, take a few moments at the end of the webinar. Um, let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like to hear about um, topically uh, in the future. All meetings and teleconferences of the Energy Storage Association are held in accordance with our antitrust guidelines. Uh, we ask you to abide by these guidelines during today's webinar. Full guidelines are available in the members area of the ESA website. Uh, if you are not yet an ESA member and would like more information, you can reach out to my colleague Richie O'Neill. Uh, membership includes free access to all our webinars, including those for members uh, only, uh, among numerous other benefits. So please reach out uh, for more information. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to give you a brief update on some upcoming ESA events. Uh, we hope you will save the date uh, for the 2019 ESA Storage Exchange. Uh, that'll be October 15th and 16th in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, Storage Exchange is an event designed to examine the steps necessary to successfully integrate uh, an energy storage project uh, and evaluate the different ways companies are deploying, uh, deploying storage to lower costs, uh, reduce emissions, uh, and establish a more resilient grid. Uh, we'll have a call for abstracts going out uh, about that soon, uh, and we hope you guys can, uh, can mark that on your calendar uh, and make it out to join us uh, in Washington State this fall. Uh, today's speakers, uh, we have Emma Elkvist, uh, Engineer for Energy Optimization Modeling at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We have Steve Casey, uh, Manager for Strategic Planning at Eversource, and Keith Martin, Co-Head of Projects for the United States at Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand over to Emma. Emma, all yours. Thank you. So you can um, start on slide two. I just wanted to start with kind of a brief uh, intro to why we're talking about storage now in particular. So along with a lot of other clean energy technologies, we've seen a, a dramatic uh, drop in the cost of lithium ion batteries. Um, to the point where they're becoming cost effective in settings where perhaps they were not um, cost effective before. You can move on to slide three, please. So when we talk about uh, energy storage for the distributed energy use cases, we're often talking about it in conjunction with renewable energy technologies, in particular, solar PV. So the value case for PV is relatively straightforward and well understood. Um, you install solar PV on your roof, the sun shines, uh, electricity is generated, and your utility consumption and cost is lowered. Battery storage, in contrast, is a lot more complicated. They inherently don't generate any electricity they simply shift energy from one time period to another. And so if all you do is install a battery, um, nothing, nothing's going to happen. You kind of have to tell the battery um, what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And so typically batteries can uh, only do one thing at a time. They can um, be charged or they can discharge energy. And so the cost of energy at the time when it's stored um, must be cheaper than the cost of energy when it's used in order for battery storage to provide value. And so to maximize your return on investment for this battery storage, you must determine um, what application your battery should serve at any given point. You can go on to the next slide, please. 
So there's a range of use cases for distributed energy storage, and I'll go through four of them here. Starting with what's um, historically perhaps most common um, is, a, is an off-grid microgrid. And so this is at a site where you are, um, don't have connection to the utility. And battery storage in conjunction with um, often diesel generators and renewable energy technologies are providing continuous power in lieu of the utility. This works um, at sites with high um, fuel costs or um, if there are grid connected sites that have very low grid reliability. We're also seeing an uptick in grid connected battery storage applications. And so here the purpose of the battery is not to um, be part of a system that provides continuous power, but rather to lower your cost of utility purchases. These systems are cost effective in areas where your utility rate has high demand charges, where you might have a time of use component to your bill, so um, electricity being cheaper at certain times and more expensive at certain times or where there are ancillary service markets where your behind the meter storage system may be able to participate. You can also configure these grid connected systems um, to, in addition to provide uh, cost savings while the grid is operating, um, be able to provide power during a grid outage. And so these um, are kind of more costly because there are more components that need to be added to the storage system in order to be able to island it or for power to be provided when there's um, no utility grid power. So it's cost, uh, cost effective in areas where um, these grid connected systems are cost effective. Um, and they also work where the site has a uh, requirement around resilience. And finally, there are some, um, some projects where um, sites are installing large-scale storage in conjunction with renewables, but rather than using that electricity on site, are um, exporting or, or selling that into a market. So this works in an area where there is a deregulated market, um, where there is an off-taker that's interested, and where there is um, large land availability for the large-scale renewable energy systems. Um, you can go to slide five, please. So this slide details um, a little bit more what the different value streams are by these different use cases. And so the first one we talked about here, that's the fuel offset. So this is for storage in conjunction with renewables offset fuels in an off-grid or remote location. Um, for grid connected systems, there's also, um, as I was mentioning on the previous slide, uh, demand charge reduction, so using the stored energy to reduce your demand charges on your utility bill, or energy arbitrage, so shifting energy from um, an on-peak to off-peak hours to help lower that cost. There are also um, utility providers that um, offer demand response program where the storage may be able to discharge um, as required by the utility, uh, and you receive as a behind-the-meter customer uh, a revenue from that. You can also, um, from behind the meter, um, sometimes part participate in ancillary service markets um, where you're able to bid in your systems for things like um, frequency regulation or capacity markets. Finally, there are other value streams um, such as voltage support or um, transmission and distribution upgrade deferrals that may um, be accessible to a behind the meter customer, but would have to be some kind of arrangement with a um, servicing provider um, to make sure that that is a benefit to kind of both the servicing utility and the behind the meter customer. You can go on to the next slide, please, slide six. So this is just an example of kind of how um, battery storage can be used in conjunction with renewable energy to help lower this particular site's cost of electricity. And so you're looking at here a week of electricity consumption um, from a site. The total load or consumption at the site is the thicker black line um, that's up at the top of the chart. So it goes up during the day and down at night. 
So that um, electricity consumption or load is met by some combination here of the utility grid in gray, uh, on-site solar in blue, and battery storage in orange. You can also see gray peaks up above that uh, on-site load. That is the uh, battery storage system being charged by the grid. And so you can see here that the PV system in blue is offsetting a fair amount of the um, energy purchases. But that late in the afternoon, as the solar production is starting to taper, um, the demand or load at the site is still relatively high. And so the battery system is able to discharge for um, just a couple of hours in the late afternoon to help lower the total demand of the site from about 27 megawatts down to about 22 megawatts. You can also see um, on Thursday where this load or peak demand at the site is not very high, the batteries here being used to shift um, energy usage from the early morning hours where the cost of electricity is relatively high to um, the late afternoon where again the cost of electricity is more expensive. Um, finally on slide seven, you can move to the next slide please. Um, things to consider when you're evaluating whether or not storage makes sense at your particular site. So the first one is the cost of the storage system, which as I mentioned before, has come down drastically over the past um, 10 years or so, but is still relatively expensive. There are incentives and policies to um, lower that cost of, of storage, in particular in California, there is the SGIP incentive, there are also um, federal level incentives where when you couple a storage system with uh, renewable energy and use the renewable energy to charge that storage system, you can take advantage of renewable-based incentives. Um, one of the most important drivers for your, a given site is your particular cost and consumption um, of electricity. There are also um, ancillary service markets that you may or may not be able to participate in that can kind of further enhance the value of the system. And then um, another kind of consideration here is whether or not um, there are resilience goals at your site and where you may um, want to use the storage to provide electricity in the event of a grid outage. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Emma. Uh, a reminder that everyone can submit questions uh, via the chat box in your browser, and we'll do Q&A uh, at the end of our speakers. Uh, next, we have Steve Casey, uh, Manager for Strategic Planning at Eversource. Uh, Steve, all yours. Okay, thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Uh, appreciate the time to uh, give you a little update on what Eversource has been doing. Uh, I'm actually going to focus on um, our utility scale grid connected storage. We do have some, you know, other projects going on uh, through our energy efficiency group, but behind the meter, I'm not going to really spend much time on those. So this will be more focused on um, utility scale grid connected storage. So my first page here, I just, in case anyone didn't know uh, who Eversource is, uh, you know, we're the biggest electric utility in New England. We have 4 million electric, gas, and water customers. Uh, we're in three states, as you can see in the map. Um, you know, we, we um, have a lot of uh, transmission, distribution, gas, and water uh, lines. And the only generation that we own at this point is uh, 70 megawatts of solar in Massachusetts. So we're pretty much fully deregulated and are really a transmission distribution focused company uh, in our area. So that's just so people know who we are. Um, so the next page here is re related to um, kind of high level how we see different value factors related to storage. We, we've been looking at this for a while and this, this these factors became apparent to us several years ago when we were uh, beginning our, our um, research on storage. And location is very important um, as far as we're concerned in terms of how storage um, 
can be technically or economically viable. So both geographically and where where on the electrical infrastructure um, it gets located is is very important. Um, we've mostly focused all of our efforts to date on the distribution system, and um, you know distribution systems can be very uh, but you know very specific to different locations and. Uh, that's very important uh, factor when we're looking at where to um, potentially put storage. Um, I'll echo Emma had a, had her slide there about um, you know the next item here: policy rules, size. These things matter, um, especially early on. Um, and in New England, you know, there's different rules that need to be followed. Uh, in and there's different incentives or um, mandates that are happening. Massachusetts uh, has a thousand megawatt hour mandate or target that it's looking to fill over the next five years. So that's that's important, and we think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, as Emma said, costs costs are coming down. We see that she Emma showed that in her slide, and we think as costs come down. Uh, and the technology continues to improve in terms of energy density and um, kind of the functionality of the storage. Um, those things are very important, and, and those two factors are going to make it possible to um, allow storage to be more economic and technically feasible over the course of time here. And then kind of the secret sauce of storage in our mind is how you actually control the storage. Um, we think you know people are getting good at building storage and putting it in service. Um, and uh, that's not something that seems to be a big barrier, but once you have it in service, it needs to be able to do what you want it to do. So yeah we we're we're keenly focused on, the fact that you need to be able to control the storage to do exactly what you want it to, and gaining that experience is going to be very important as we move forward. And that's part of um, you know how we're uh, proceeding with our storage program. So on here, I'm going to just give you an overview of how we're viewing storage. Uh, we do operate in Connecticut, Mass, New Hampshire. As I said, New Hampshire or Massachusetts has a thousand megawatt hour storage target, and it also passed um, a Clean Peaks legislation last year, which is um, we think is a way for them to promote more storage. A certain percentage of the peak will have to be served through renewable uh, energy resources, and uh, putting storage with solar or other renewables is going to be probably a big way to to meet those targets over time. Uh, Connecticut uh, mandates us to have some storage projects, which we've been um, contemplating and uh, are looking to proceed with um, in the future in Connecticut. And then we also have some uh, other activity in grid mod, with grid mod proceedings going on in Connecticut and New Hampshire. So we, we feel in uh, our states there's a good push for um, storage to be uh, one of the resources that are available for us to use in our transmission and distribution operations for customer benefits. The use cases that we're looking at, uh, a big part of it is deferring traditional investment um, or avoiding traditional investment. Uh, we, have a, we have a strong um, drive for re reliability for our customers and resiliency. We, we get hit with bad storms on a regular basis and using storage can potentially help with that, with those both of those um, reliability and resiliency goals that we have. Peak management is a big part of um, what we think storage can help us with, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, again, power quality, we have certain areas in our service territory that have been saturated with uh, solar and we're having uh, power quality issues with flicker and reverse power flow on our transformers. So we think storage can help us in that area. Um, 
and that goes along with renewables integration, you know, being able to potentially interconnect more renewables in certain areas by having storage um, on our system. And then also GHG reductions, which ties back into the Mass Clean Peaks legislation. If you're, if you're uh, charging your storage with a renewable or at times of low GHG emissions, um, that can help with the, re with the GHG redu reduction goals. So on the right side here, this is kind of a high level view of how we look at our, our business case. Um, if we can see that we can defer a traditional investment or avoid a traditional investment and then stack on top of that um, utilizing the storage to discharge at the monthly and yearly peaks, then we can reduce um, transmission and capacity charges for our customers because in New England, um, RNS, RNS charges, that's regional network service through transmission are set based on monthly peaks and your share of monthly peaks. And if we can reduce those for our customers, our customers will save some um, money on that. And then also the in the capacity market um, is set by the yearly peak. And if we can reduce those, we can reduce uh, capacity obligations for our customers as well. So when we um, add up all those benefits and compare them to the cost of the storage, uh, we're looking to actually have storage have a positive uh, benefit cost ratio for our customers and actually save them money in their rates by putting storage on our system. The, I'm now going to just shift gears and just talk about two of our projects that we're working on right now. One is on the Cape and one is on Martha's Vineyard. So the first one here is a, the Cape. Um, some of you may know uh, Cape Cod. Um, it's a long peninsula off of Massachusetts. And if you look at this picture, you can see that uh, from Wellfleet, which is kind of in the middle, there's a substation there. And north of Wellfleet to Provincetown, there's basically one distribution circuit that serves all of those uh, customers downstream of Wellfleet. And um, there's uh, this is you know kind of out in the out in the weather. It's a very uh, susceptible to storms and other. Um, uh, reliability issues. So if that line goes down, um, the, the biggest loads in this area are in Provincetown. And you know that provides for um, poor reliability in this area. And we have been looking for solutions for this for a while. The town of Provincetown and Truro, well, well um, all along there, they were hoping or looking for us to put in a new distribution circuit, and they were looking for that to be underground. Um, the Cape Cod National Seashore is actually um, in this area between Wellfleet and Provincetown, so it's a very hard place to build anything. Um, so we are looking to uh, put in a storage project, and I'll talk about that here. Uh, you know, lithium-ion battery, um, 25 megawatts, 38 megawatt hours. Um, we're actually working with the town of Provincetown where it's go we've recently got a town approval to enter into a lease with the town for some property at their transfer station that we are planning to put this uh, storage in that location and um, that will help when the when that circuit goes down we can now power up all customers um, from the fault into Provincetown or also from the Wellfleet substation to where the fault is. So we expect a very high uh, improvement in reliability of up to 50%. We won't have to build that distribution line through the Cape Cod National Seashore. And the storage can also be um, utilized to uh, relieve um, that circuit, and if the, if the loads 
become high and we have equipment problems. So that's that project. It's been approved by the DPU for $40 million. We're in the process of um, implement, implementing that project and we're, our goal is to hopefully have that online by the end of next year. The next project is in Martha's Vineyard, which some of you may know is an island off of Massachusetts. It's served by four undersea cables. Um, currently, we have a contract with Genon for five diesel generators that are on the island. Um, they're pretty old. Um, you know, they emit. Um, you know, they admit when they run, obviously, and uh, we have. Uh, we we'd like to try to show that basically we can um, help utilize batteries instead of diesels on that island in terms of relieving uh, cable loadings and um, and also for contingent other contingencies. So there's so there's some solar on the island now, but it's getting to the point where it's saturated, so we we think the storage is or the storage will help um, improve the ability to interconnect more solar on the island. And it also helps um, reduce the GHG if we can avoid running those diesels um, as much as we uh, have in the past. So the next page kind of shows, again, lithium ion, reduce, we're, we're trying to show we can reduce the use of diesels. You know, eventually we'd like to just you know, not have those diesels. Um, that would be part of a larger contingency study for the for the whole island. But we do believe that these batteries will um, take the place of the diesels um, significantly. We actually have some. Uh, we have a service center on Oak Bluffs that we're um, contemplating. That we're actually you know in the process of designing um, a building for that location where we would put these batteries. Um, and it will help uh, achieve these all of these goals. That's a $15 million project. It's a 4.920 megawatt hour battery. We do have, we, we did actually um, propose a phase two for Martha's Vineyard, which would add additional um, 10 megawatts and 64 megawatt hours, and that would bring us to the point where we wouldn't have to rely on the diesels much at all, and then ultimately phase those out um, even during uh, contingencies when if the submarine cables go down. So that is, I believe, the end of my presentation. Yep. Great. Thank you all Thanks for so listening. Yeah. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, reminder once again that uh, if you have any questions, you can submit them in the chat box in your browser and we will uh, come to those um, in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, next, we have Keith Martin, uh, co-head of projects for the United States at Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, Keith, all yours. Thank you, Tom. Everything I'm going to say you can find on Google if you put in nuts and bolts of financing storage, Norton Rose, N-O-R-T-O-N, Rose, R-O-S-E. First point is if you go to the first slide, maybe the next one, there are two ways to look at financing of projects. One is that if you want to borrow a large amount of money to build a project, the bank will focus on the amount of money you have to repay the debt. Seems obvious, but the bank will require you to lock in a revenue stream and also to lock down your costs the difference between those two is what you have to pay debt service on the bank, on the bank loan. Banks will focus on the predictability of the costs. They'll focus on the debt service coverage ratio, DSCR. For example, if the required debt service coverage ratio is 1.4 times the interest and principal payments on the debt, then the net revenue stream, each payment period, must be at least 1.4 times what you owe the bank. The other way to, fo to think about project finance is it is an exercise in risk allocation. 
Nothing gets financed until all the risks have been identified and allocated among the parties to the transaction. A basic rule of thumb in project finance is that the party who best understands the risk is the one who has to take it. One reason why storage finance is taking time to get off the ground is it takes time to catalog all the risks. The banks in this market will not take technology risk, so they want to ease into financing these projects, do some smaller pilot scale projects, get their feet wet, make them feel they understand the risk before moving on to something larger. Next slide. The market is not yet at a point of financing projects like it might finance a local McDonald's franchise on the basis of projected hamburger sales. Banks are not willing to assume hamburger purchasers will show up. They want to see a contract that requires payments. The, there are various storage business models. Emma talked about some in the distributed market. Uh, you heard from Eversource, from Steve, about what it is doing. These are more utility-scale storage efforts. The Rocky Mountain Institute estimates that up to 13 different revenue streams can be earned from storage, but only a few are common today. In the distributed market, what we have seen mainly have been shared savings models, where batteries are deployed at commercial properties, and the owners, the host customers, uh, pay a share of their savings on electricity charges. In addition, there may be a capacity payment for the local utility so that it can use the battery as well. In the residential solar market, in the large solar utility scale market where batteries are added, nobody focuses on the revenue so much in isolation from the battery, they just focus on whether the solar project or rooftop systems have enough to pay off the financing. In standalone storage, at the moment there seem to be only three revenue streams that are being realized. One is a capacity payment, sometimes there is also a use payment, and then third, there may be ancillary services payments. The, we found the financiers at the moment are relying only on the capacity and sizing the amount of debt they will pay. All of this, the fact that there may be 13 revenue streams, though, raises the question, what happens to the upside revenue? It's not taken into account by the financiers when they size how much financing they're willing to provide. Therefore, the sponsors want to keep the upside. This raises some hard tax ownership issues particularly in the solar market where a large part of the financing is tax credits on the battery as well as the solar project, how to keep the upside revenue without causing the battery to be considered owned by the sponsor and not the tax equity vehicle is a tough issue. Next slide. Storage works best currently if it can be considered part of a new solar project or alternatively part of an existing wind farm on which a treasury cash grant was paid. If you can do that, then it's possible to claim a 30% investment tax credit on the battery. A credit can only be claimed on batteries that are considered part of the solar generating equipment or the wind generating equipment and not a battery that is considered an, a transmission asset. The IRS has issued three private letter rulings showing cases where tax credits can be claimed. It has also declined to issue a number of rulings where people have pressed the envelope on fact patterns. In general, the, the same legal entity should be used to own the battery and the solar project. I'll focus on solar since that's the most common use. Second, the battery should be on the low side of the step-up transformer. Third, it should operate ideally like a knob on a motor. It should regulate the rate at which the electricity from the solar project is fed into the grid. If all those things are true, then it looks more like a piece of the generating equipment. There is a 75% cliff, meaning that whatever percentage of the electricity comes from solar as opposed to the grid will establish how much of the 30% investment tax credit can be claimed 
if in the first year after the battery is put in service, 90% of the electricity charge comes from solar, then the tax credit is probably 30% times 90% or 27%. If in any of the next four years the solar storage percentage drops, there's the potential for the unvested tax credits to be recaptured. They have to be repaid to the Treasury. The tax credits vest rateably over five years. Next slide. The IRS is working on investment tax credit regulations. It's rewriting ones that have been on the books since 1981, that these are unlikely to be issued until next year. One thing the solar industry has been pushing hard for is to get rid of this 75% cliff and instead just have a primary use test. If the battery is used primarily to store solar electricity, it's considered part of the project. A bill to allow tax credits for standalone storage is gradually gathering steam. There are three tax proposals of great interest to the power industry that the industry hopes might move this year. The storage proposal is viewed by lobbyists as having the best chance of the three of moving if any new tax proposals move this year. What the current version of that bill would do is just to provide the same tax credits for standalone storage that are available currently for solar, 30% for projects that start construction this year, 26% if they start in 2020, 22% if they start in 2021, and after that, only a 10% credit. The last point I'll make, not on the slides, uh, we heard from a solar CEO that storage is getting the most traction currently in markets where people don't do math. So it gets traction in the rooftop sector where the take pickup rate for batteries uh, is over 10% in California, maybe 15 currently, and increasing rapidly. However, the tax equity market where these projects are financed is putting a cap on the um, use of storage. The market remains worried still about fire risk, so it places a cap of 10%, 15% usually on the percentage of rooftop solar systems in any financing portfolio that can have storage. The Arizona fire uh, in the past week, on a lithium ion battery did not help things. But in general, for someone who's in the market looking at these projects, it does feel like we're about to reach a tipping point where storage will take off in a major way. So Tom, that's all I have. Great. Thanks so much, um, and thanks so much to all three of our speakers. Um, now we'll move to Q&A. Um, you still can submit questions via the chat box, uh, and we'll be reading those out to our speakers here. Uh, our very first question, uh, I think uh, I'll put this one to Steve, but maybe Emma might want to jump in afterwards, uh, comes from Amanda Brown. Uh, her question is, how are you seeing the value of leasing the energy storage services uh, i.e. energy as a service, uh, as OPEX uh, versus buying the storage asset outright and owning it in a CapEx model, uh, especially the utilities uh, where they get a rate of return on CapEx. Yeah, this is Steve. We're, we're really looking at it as, you know, right now as um, initial, these projects are kind of initial demonstration projects. We don't have anything, you know, connected to our system and doing anything like this right now. So we're, these are rate-based projects. You know, we, we're open down the road to other, you know, models, but right now we're, we're focused on, you know, designing, building, owning, um, operating storage for us to gain that experience that we're, that we're really in need of with storage. All right, thanks. Uh, Emma, is that I something your think, team has looked at at all? Sorry, yeah, I don't think ahead. that answers the question, but that's where we are. Fair enough. Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, a lot of the stakeholders that we work with are federal agencies, and there's a lot of interest in the concept of energy as a service, where the agency doesn't have to worry about maintenance or running these systems, um, but can rather just benefit um, and get a cost reduction and potentially having these systems in the event of a grid outage. Um, currently, there's not a clear pathway f um, for federal agencies to be able to um, 
kind of clearly access this energy as a service, um, but that's something that's of, of great interest, I think, to the federal sector. Great, thanks. Um, there's another one uh, for Steve. Uh, this one comes from Jesse Hoffman. Uh, for the Cape Cod project, uh, how did you address fault clearing while the grid is in an island mode, given the lower short circuit ratio of the battery energy storage system? Yeah, that's actually just so, just um, to clarify. I'm not an engineer. I'm I'm more on the development side. Um, I work with a lot of engineers, and this question has come up every time I talk to somebody who's on the engineering side. But our our protection and controls and distribution engineering and system planning people have been working on you know that question. I know there's a there's a response to it that's acceptable. Um, we are adding um, different kind of uh, distribution automation you know, equipment along the line there um, from Wellfleet to Provincetown and uh, our dynamic modeling and all of that has shown you know, ways to resolve that. So I, I wish I had a better specific answer, but that is being addressed. Uh, through our engineering and protection and controls group, along with, um, you know, we have some technical consultants that uh, have been able to resolve these issues. Great, thanks. Uh, I think we have a, a clarifying question here from Valerie Barros uh, for Keith. Um, regarding your, your, your comment, Keith, that uh, on the 10 to 15 percent cap, um, she wonders, does that mean that at most, 10 to 15 percent of the total value of a portfolio can come from storage? Well, it depends. I, I think most of the term sheets we've seen recently have done it by capacity. Okay. So that um, of the capacity, so that would be the rest would have to be coming from solar or just across oh, a. No, I thought she was portfolio. asking about the tax equity cap yeah. that. Is yeah. placed on how many batteries are allowed in a residential solar portfolio. Usually, it's it's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent in the current market, and the it's it's a uh, percentage of the capacity of the total portfolio. Okay. So the systems, if if the systems are 100, um, take a foolish number, 100 megawatts, 10 megawatts um, of the systems can have batteries associated with them. Okay, right. Uh, to follow on from that, a question has just come in from Paul uh, Smirchansky. Uh, he says, uh, are you seeing tax equity investors getting comfortable with grid charging on utility scale solar plus storage projects? And what safeguards do they require to be in place to mitigate the recapture risk? We haven't, um, I'm just trying to think if we've seen, I don't think we've seen a tax equity financing yet at utility scale where there has been a battery. We've certainly worked on utility scale projects with batteries um, in the Treasury cash grant era where the Treasury just paid grants and where batteries were, were added to large projects after they were already wholly owned by a utility, for example. Where this comes up is mostly currently is the rooftop sector. And there we've seen a variety of steps taken by the um, investors. Number one is they're less keen to do batteries that are on the AC, AC side of the inverter than the DC side for fear that there may be charging from the grid. Uh, the rooftop companies have said that they have software that prevents that sort of charge, but it's impossible, uh, they, they say, to prevent any electron from reaching from the grid. Uh, second thing, sometimes the tax equity investors will price the um, investment credit on the battery, uh, assuming only 95% solar charge, just to give them some margin. And then finally, the risk is always going to be on the sponsor. So um, sometimes there have been special indemnities asked for related to batteries. Sometimes it's just part of the general uh, investment tax credit indemnity the sponsor is expected to provide. All right, thanks. Um, another question from Amanda Brown. Um, 
how best can we reconcile if, PV, if the PV owner does not own the battery, um, although the battery charges from the PV 75% of the time? Uh, in essence, the storage is owned by a different party than the PV owner. Can the ITC still be captured for that PV plus storage project? I think that's for you, Keith. I think it's hard. Um, you could have two different legal entities that um, neither of which exists for tax purposes because they have a common owner and they're owned 100%, and that might work. But if you separate ownership, it's a little hard to see how the battery can be considered part of the solar generating equipment. It's owned by a different party. Okay. Uh, for Steve, um, from Nicole Efron, um, you mentioned that controlling the storage is an important driver of value. Uh, how are you planning to control these two battery projects? Uh, autonomous operation with active intervention from grid ops or some other consideration, uh, and how do you view the relationship between battery control and value? Uh, yeah, so we're looking at um, hiring an EPC contractor to install the batteries along with the control systems that we are going to need for the use cases that we're contemplating for these two. So um, that control system will be um, integrated into our system operations, uh, you know, so our so that you can have um, control over it through either, you know, predefined algorithms that uh, turn on when we, you know, turn it on when we need it, turn it off when we need it, or manual intervention through our control uh, operations. So that has been part of um, a process that we're going through now. So I think that was the first part of the question. What was the next part of the question? Um, let's see, I'll bring it right back up here. Um, how do you view the relationship between battery control and value? Yeah, so we're obviously, we're putting these projects in for very specific reasons, right? So the, the Provincetown Outer Cape project, you know, that the reason for that is to improve reliability and resiliency. So, you know, the whole purpose of that is to defer that additional line. And so controlling and being able to operate that when we need it uh, at an instance notice is, is really all part of the value of putting that battery in. Uh, on the Martha's Vineyard side, when we're, when we're um, having uh, high loads during the summer and those, those undersea cables are um, getting to their uh, max ratings, that's when the diesels would turn on um, usually and being able to control the batteries at the, those, you know, specific times is really going to be critical because that's the value, that proposition that we had. So, you know, in our case, you know, there are very specific um, reasons why controlling them and them doing what the job they're, you know, meant to do at the time they're meant to do it is all is, you know, critical to gaining the value of those batteries. Great, thanks. Um, a a two-part question here from Evan Bixby. Uh, first, he asks, are circuit maps with power quality issues available to developers to allow for more granular and accurate project siting? Uh, and then otherwise, uh, well, I guess in, in, in the case that if they weren't, um, how could developers make informed decisions about project siting to facilitate maximum grid benefit uh, and presumably maximum project value uh, with information asymmetry between developers and utilities? Uh, perhaps for Steve and Emma? Could you repeat that question again? Sure. Basically, um, if a third-party developer uh, is looking at, you know, how, where, when to develop a project, uh, if they don't know what power quality issues might be out on the grid, um, how can they create a project for maximum grid benefit? Um, you know, the, 
uh, he notes the information asymmetry between developers and utilities. Um, yeah, I don't have, I don't, I don't necessarily have a good answer right now. I think over time, like I said, our our view is, you know, we're early on storage. You know, we're trying to understand exactly how it can work and uh, what it can do and how it impacts our system. You know, the fact that we have responsibility for, you know, people's reliability and put getting the power on if it goes off and getting the calls, you know, when it is off. We're trying to take an approach where we gain that experience and understanding and over time, I think there will be, you know, different ways for different parties to, to you know, be involved with the with, with what we want to do for our system. I just I just don't think we're we're quite there yet, uh, you know, as a company or as an industry. That that's just my personal view on that. Mr. Keith, anything to add? I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything either. Okay. Um, a question from Raymond Barrow. Um, how do federal or state regulatory requirements affect project economics and risk for battery development? Uh, anyone want to take that? Well, this, this is Steve. The, uh, you know, the fire is a big, is a big deal for us personally. Um, you know, as I said, we're we're working right now with the town of Provincetown, with the town of Oak Bluffs, um, with the Mass DPU to, um, you know, get our permitting and siting and zoning set so that we can build these. And safety is one of the questions that have come up, you know, consistently since we've been doing this, and we take it very seriously. I mean. At, at our, you know, at, at our utility company, safety is number one. With, you know, as with most utility companies, we want, you know, that's pretty much our priority every day. Um, and with this, and you know, again, this goes back to our experience. We're trying to um, gain the understanding and knowledge and experience around these batteries, and especially around the safety of them. Um, so. The regulators, the towns, the, the so the state, the federal, and the and the local um, people that we are talking to are all very um, interested in fire safety. So that impacts it in terms of how we do the development, how, what kind of fire safety protection systems we put in, how it, how the batteries are designed, and all of that impacts you know the timelines and costs and so forth. So. It, it's critical to us. I'll add, uh, there, there are regulatory lawyers here who are much better on this, but how exactly storage is treated for regulatory purposes is a big issue. FERC issued an order, order number 841, that seems a little like Obamacare in people's inability to explain what it does succinctly. The what the battery owners are looking for is the ability to participate in markets on the same basis that other generators are. And that has been the direction in these markets. These, uh, the classification is generation, transmission, or as a hybrid asset also goes to how the costs of the asset are recovered, who pays for it. These are all big concerns that have not been uh, fully worked out uh, but are moving in the right direction. Yeah, again, this is Steve. I just want to mention, I don't know if this is clear to people, but we're not considering any market participation with our batteries. That That's not part of the value stream that we are looking at. Um, but we do realize that the rules, you know, in ISO and uh, with the states or others, that's, in FERC, that's going to be important. Um, for a lot of people in the storage industry, but well, you know these are these these projects that we're doing and what we're contemplating, they're really truly distribution system assets to provide um, 
service to our customers in an, in a way that you know makes sense technically and economically for for the customers. So, um, but we we understand that those rules will impact you know how people um, you know interact with storage in the future. Great, thanks. I have a question from James uh, Chabonneau. Um, how do you account for auxiliary loads, uh, namely the large HVAC load at night, uh, and how that affects the, uh, the ITC for a DC connected battery at a solar site? Uh, the HVAC will draw a load at night when the sun isn't shining. Well, I don't think drawing from the battery is the problem. The issue is where is the charge coming from to charge the battery? And currently, IRS rules require that the battery be used to store solar if it's considered part of a solar facility. The issue is how much other charge can there be. In the three private letter rulings the IRS issued, two were utility scale. The IRS uh, told us that there was not going to be a 75% cliff there. They just focused on the particular facts of those cases. In one case, revenue from other uses like ancillary services was expected to account for about 3% of total revenue, and the other one, 15%, those were not problems. The third ruling uh, involved rooftop solar. The rooftop company was unable to represent that the battery would be used primarily to store solar, and on that basis, the IRS said there's a 75% cliff. Um, again, just looking at the charge going in, not the discharge. Great, thanks. Um, and our, our last question here uh, for Steve. Uh, Amanda Brown asks, uh, regarding Eversource storage projects, uh, are those going out as RFPs or competitive solicitations, uh, or has the utility already chosen a battery vendor for those projects? Yeah, so those are RFPs uh, that went out to a um, you know, a bid list that we had determined through, you know, a process internally here. So, um, and that's all in process right now. The, right. the selection has not been made yet, but it's in process. Great, thanks. Yep. Um, thank you very much to all those who asked questions uh, and again to our three presenters. Uh, before we conclude today's webinar, I'd uh, like to remind everyone about uh, the Storage Exchange um, event in Bellevue, Washington, October 15th and 16th. Uh, mark that on your calendars. Um, and thanks again to everyone, our speakers, participants. Um, please take a moment to, to fill out the feedback box, which ought to pop up when you, the webinar closes. Uh, you can also email ideas for future webinars to education at energystorage.org. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon, um, and have a great afternoon and evening. Uh, goodbye.